video going, screen share going. All right, so let's go over the midterm and then we'll continue on with uh, stacks. Uh, grade breakdown for the midterm. Uh, lowest score was a 25. Uh, maximum value was a 90. Um, so I think we'll see uh, there were some commonalities on where things were missed and we'll talk about those. Um, average was just under a 70. So I think the average was actually uh, pretty good. Uh, if you're down in that uh, 20 and 30 range, you might ask uh, why. Um, I think most of those people basically left all the programming questions blank. So that probably is why. So the follow-up would be, why did I leave the programming questions blank? Um, now, one thing you uh, probably noticed, and this is a true statement since uh, that I probably mentioned in 200 and again in 250, the farther you get into the program, the pickier I'm gonna end up being when it comes to uh, um, programming stuff, not meaning that I'm taking off points for like missing semicolons and things like that, but um, the uh, expected competency in programming solutions is expected to continue to grow. And when you have an answer that just has some random crap in it that looks right-ish, where you may have gotten a partial, well, not looks right, that looks like it has some stuff that is part of a correct solution, uh, where you maybe would have gotten some points in 200. Uh, once you get to 300, that doesn't earn you points when it's obvious that you didn't really know what you were doing. Uh, so we'll walk through this and uh, uh, go from there. Uh, so let's see. First one, why are arrays considered to be fast and memory inefficient while linked lists are considered to be slow and memory efficient? All right, so this has to do with, uh, I mean, the kind of the key key phrase looking I was looking for there is something with contiguous memory. Arrays are stored in contiguous memory, so memory right next to each other. And therefore we can uh, mathematically calculate the uh, uh, position, like if I want to get to bucket three of an array, I can go directly to that memory location given the base address of that array. So we get the speed benefit of uh, um, all that memory being contiguous. Uh, with the memory cost uh, uh, problem, the in memory inefficiency portion of this being that you have to know the maximum size of your array from the get-go and you're going to request, you need a block of memory that is big enough to hold all of that right next to each other in memory. The flip side is your linked list is considered to be memory efficient because all your data is stored strewn about memory potentially. You don't need to know how much data you're gonna store uh, um, from the get-go, um, but it's also slower because you, in order to get to bucket five of a linked list, you have to start at the beginning of the linked list and then traverse through the linked list. Yeah. So if you have a linked list that just sort of happens to be all be contiguous, why would still be the same thing in the case that is contiguous? Correct. Yeah. So the question was if you have a linked list where just the moon's aligned and it just so happened that it handed you memory addresses that were contiguous. We can't make the assumption that it's contiguous, so we wouldn't have it wouldn't going to bucket three would still require you to go to bucket zero, ask him where his next node is, go there, ask him where his next node is, so on and so forth. Just because you happen to be not traveling real far in memory doesn't mean you didn't still have to follow those pointers rather than just do a quick math problem when you're boom at the memory address. All right, any other questions about that one? I think that one was pretty good all in all, um, minus like, uh, you know, if you didn't say anything about contiguous memory or strongly imply the concept of contiguous memory in there. All right, um, next one, create a class for representing, I'm gonna do this maybe in like Adam. Create a class for representing student objects. A student has a name, an email, and a GPA. Make sure to include all necessary constructors and getters and setters. 
um, you can assume the header file already exists. So you did not have to write the header file for this, but you did need to um, write the constructor and you needed to write the uh, getters and uh, uh, setters, which I actually don't think I held you accountable for, if I kind of recall. I think if you wrote it uh, reasonable enough with the constructor, I think I gave you the points or at least most of the points. So this guy is, you know, you could do it and like an include a student.hpp or something like up, up top. I didn't care if you did that or not. I told you the header file exists. I wasn't necessarily looking for that, but you would have something like student. Um, so you needed to make sure you understood that with the implementations file, you were linking this back to the header file and we want a constructor for this guy. So this guy is going to be, constructor's name will be student. Uh, what did I say? It's taking in a name, an email, and a GPA. So name would be string, email would be string, um, GPA might be a double. Now, some people also came up here and they would have said, you know, we want to include um, string, which is fine. That gives you access to the C++ string. Again, I didn't hold you accountable for that. <clears throat> Inside here, you would have said this name is equal to name. This email is equal to email this. GPA is equal to GPA. So that would be an example of the constructor for this guy. Uh, and then for, you know, presumably in this header file, all of these guys were private in the private section. So we would have had uh, getters for each of these. So we would have like a get name. get email, a get GPA, and this guy is going to return a string. This guy is going to return a string. This guy is going to return a double. So this will be return name. Um, this email, return this GPA. And then similarly, you would have setters for these guys. Void student set name. Set email, set GPA. All right, so something along those lines. Uh, most important is probably the constructor thing here, but this, you know, certainly this syntax right here, showing how you're linking this to that header file. Um, understanding that for constructors, you're taking in those parameters and you're initializing your fields. Uh, people were creating main methods and creating instances of things and embedding instances inside the constructor or whatever. Um, but generally speaking, I think that's along the lines of what number two um, should look like. All right, questions about that one. All right. Next one, convert this dude from binary to hex. All 
Um, as usual, another warning, if you give me just a hard-coded answer and don't show me any work and you get it wrong, I have no way to give you points uh, to see what you missed. So if we have this value and we're converting this guy to hex, remember we have our shortcut thing here, right? So with hexadecimal values, every four bits is used to represent a single hextet, all right? so. Uh, one, one, zero, one. This is the value. This is ones, twos, fours, eight. So this is eight, 12, 13. So this is actually a 13. This guy here is a 12. So that's a D. That's a C. So the answer is DC. All right, good. At the front. Yeah, you attack on. So what he's asking here is, um, for instance, if I was, uh, we use just a different example here. Let's say I said, what is that value from decimal to hex? You would start off with the right hand side and you would start getting your groupings of four. And then you can either just leave that as one one or you can say zero zero one one uh, to get your value. So this guy would be a a three and a C. All right, other questions on that one. All right. And just to clarify, so it doesn't come up later, everybody can see the their answers, the feedback, all the <laughs> all the all the jazz. Um, okay, uh, write an error free hello world program in C plus plus. So probably wanted you to include I/O stream. I don't, I don't, although I don't think I held you to that. So you know you would do something like. Uh, include io stream and then we'd have int main int arg c char pointer pointer arg v print f slash m in there or something like that. actually i'm not using print f i'm using c out right c out zero in here like that all right so if you didn't have this in there and you uh had main returning void that that's fine but something along these lines showing that you know that the header for main even though technically this isn't required i enjoyed seeing it um so you understand uh you know what the stuff is in there so i didn't take points off for that um but something along these lines that has a whole lot of the syntax there I saw things with like classes and stuff like that. Some people just wrote their answer in Java. Um, don't do that. <laughs> Understand the starting points for these different languages. All right, questions on that one. Why are those things in the parentheses? Because you don't have to give it command line arguments. So if you don't give it command line arguments, it won't try to call these. So therefore, main won't. It'll be the the default version of main which you're giving it. It takes no parameters. Or Java forces it. All right. All right. So now we started getting into the uh, the, the 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 trouble. <laughs> the, 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 the trouble people. Um, okay, so the next several use linked lists. So actually, I'm going to start off by giving just an overarching statement. As programmers, the reason why we might go and write 
complex code with pointers and and setting next nodes and walking down a list with cur node equals this and cur node equals cur node dot get next node all this mechanical stuff the reason we write all that and hide it inside of an object is so that we don't have to use that do that again when we go and use that object later on linked lists are collection types right i can get the element of a, at a certain bucket and do something with it um, so we'll we'll see these in, as examples but a lot of the implementation of these, you know, I said you have access to all of these functions, any reasonable function you might want to have access to, yet some of you inside of your code just reinvented those functions. You started setting up pointers again and linking stuff to each other, it's like, oh, just get the next note or <laughs> something like that. All right, so this first one, assuming you have access to a linked list of integers, um, uh, similar to what we wrote in class, write a method that takes a linked list as a parameter and removes all odd numbers from that linked list. You may assume that you have access to the following methods, add front, add end, add at index, um, yada, yada, yada. So our job here is to remove all of the um, odd numbers from this, uh, from this list. All right. So we'll go over to this guy. Well, first of all, let's start off with our method header here. So we are not returning a linked list, okay? Instead, we're taking in a linked list and we are removing values from that linked list. Okay, that's what, that's what we're actually doing with it, okay? So I'm gonna kind of write it a wrong way first and then we'll walk backwards and understand why that guy's wrong. All right, so one thing we can do here is we can say um, we're going to have it return void if we call this guy remove odds and he's going to take a linked list as a parameter all right so now we can go through all the elements of this linked list um, and ask questions about each of those uh, elements so I can say for int i is equal to zero, i is less than ll get count i plus plus. That's going to be a loop that goes through, takes i on a voyage from each through each element of that list. We'll go back here. Um, get at index. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a value from the index. Now, you could have assumed it gave you a node, or you could assume it gave you an int, because I said you have access to a function called get at index. Didn't matter which of those assumptions you made. It was clear whether you knew what you were doing with it. So we might ask the question, if ll get at index, if we assume that's an int, we can just leave it like that and say mod 2 is equal to 1 that says, is that guy odd? All right, if you assume this was a, a node, then you would say something like get payload off of that, which is fine too. All right, so either way you went about that, that was okay. Uh, something that's not okay is this, LL at bucket I. Link lists are not arrays. You can't just magically use array syntax with our linked lists. So uh, we have access to functions that allow us to get things from a specific index in there. And we took advantage of those. So we want to get at index i. LL get at index i mod 2 is equal to 1. If that's a true statement, what do we want to do? Well. The thing we would say we want to do is we want to say ll dot because again we're, our job here is to remove odd values so we would say ll remove odds i'm sorry uh, remove that index i all right great but when we remove that what has now changed the size of my link list Okay, so now our loop here is off, right? I just removed a value, so the next time through, so let's say I removed a value at bucket two. 
That means next time through, I actually want to look at bucket two again, because I have a new bucket two. All right. So if I remove something here, I want to artificially subtract one from I. So that the next time through the loop, when I increment I, I'm going to check that same bucket again that I just removed, because now it's a new value that's there that I need to check. All right. So this goes through every element of my list. For each element, I ask a question. If I'm looking at an odd number, what do I do? I remove it and then adjust I so that the next time through we, we don't skip values is what we're effectively doing there. So this is an example of remove odds. There was an interesting solution um, to this. I'll write this similar to this one that does avoid the little I minus minus thing. I'm not sure it ends up making it significantly less complex because you kind of work the trick backwards. We started at ll.getCount minus one, keep going as long as I is greater than or equal to zero, subtract one from I each time. So we start at the end and walk towards the beginning. And if you do that, Removing something from the end won't break the index. All right. Kind of an interesting uh, take on it. Uh, I didn't care which one that you, you did. I think this one probably algorithmically is the better practice. Although this one definitely showed that I'm aware that there is a problem that if you start taking things out of a list, that list changes in size and I can no longer just rely on get count from this guy. He's going to give me a different value the next time through the loop. All right. So common things mix, uh, missed here. Um, you know, that, that concept of not knowing that the list changes uh, size when you remove something from it. Um, that was the most common problem. I still got you a, a good chunk of the points. Um, other common problems is just not knowing what you're doing. Um, no for loop to go through a, a linked list, not knowing what a linked list was, um, leaving the answer blank was a common, <laughs> a common mistake that was, uh, that was made. Um, at this point, I mean, you're third semester computer programming students, Leaving programming questions blank is going to start becoming, well, start. It's a problem. You should be able to write some uh, code, even if it's a little bit sketch when you're writing it on the fly. Um, to completely leave something blank is uh, shows a level of incompetence that you should not have at uh, this point, um, especially given the, uh, the theme. I mean, it's one thing if just a question was just you didn't understand what was being asked, you ran out of time, whatever, you leave one programming question blank or something, maybe that's explainable, but when you leave all of the programming questions blank, um, yeah, it's not good. Okay, so a couple of approaches uh, there. I probably like this one better, although when I was looking at this one, I found this to be uh, um, interesting i think i made even a comment you know that hey this is an interesting approach to it or something like that uh, and then i think i took off all the points to freak them out i don't think i actually did that but i should have yeah um no no because each time through you're still getting the count and you're going to only keep going as long as uh well here up on this one you're only going to keep going as long as i is less than the count so what you would have ended up doing is you would have skipped elements of the list and not asked the questions about those yeah so you would have potentially still had odd numbers in your list because you you didn't ask about bucket three because bucket three shifted to bucket two and you skipped past it and looked at bucket three yeah, but it wouldn't have crashed because you would have just exited yeah, yeah, your loop more quickly. Um, you would have taken a couple of extra. Well, you could try to like display it in the file and display it to the actual virtual object. But even displaying it would be likely based on get count. So it would just display your now potentially reduced list size. But there might be some odd numbers still left in there, which, you know, so there's like, well, look, I wrote the logic to remove odds. And then you're like, 
well, I removed the first odd. I removed a third odd. <laughs> Why is the second odd still sitting in there? It's because you you just happen to jump over that dude, and you know, just the the way the moon's aligned on your your logic. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, you can create like a second list and mark what needs to be removed. Or, I mean, I would actually say the better way of doing this, I mean, you could have, here's another approach uh, to this. You could have say something like void, remove odds. I'm not necessarily recommending this approach, but this was a fair enough approach. Um, you can say uh, linked list the odds is equal to a new linked list. And then you go through, let me just steal this guy here for time. All right. So you go through uh, um, all the elements uh, in the list. And actually what I would probably do is I would do something like this while uh, ll.get count is greater than zero as long as there's still something left in there. Um, do something like int. Ah, uh, this will work. So do something like get front. If get front, if this guy is odd, then what am I going to do with it? I'm going to go ahead and say the odds dot add end or whatever. Um, ll dot get front. And then I'll say ll dot remove front. All right. So then when all is said and done, what have I done? I've collected all my odd values inside of the odds. And as I was going along, I just kept removing um, the front of ll after I asked the question about the front of ll. Now, actually, this is we want to, whether it was odd or not, we're going to remove the front of LL. So if the front was odd, then we're going to add it to our odds. Then we'll remove front regardless. So our list keeps getting one smaller, one smaller, one smaller, one smaller. We keep doing that as long as we still have stuff in our list. As soon as we exit out of this guy, presumably our final solution is inside of the odds, right? And we want to get those values back over into LL. So now we can just write a loop for int i is equal to zero. I is less than the odds dot get count. I plus plus L, L dot add end. The odds dot get at index. something like that. So this will LL emptied out here. LL is a memory address, right? This guy holds a linked list. So actually, technically, this guy's a linked list pointer. So we should have taken in here as a parameter. So this guy holds a memory address. And that memory address, we're not changing. What we're changing is, is what is, you know, what's the first element that's in that guy. All right, so after I've removed, well, really, what did I do here? I collected all the odds and removed every value from LL. Then I went ahead and I copied the odds that I collected back into the now empty LL, leaving LL filled up with only the odd values. Actually, I was, am I collecting evens? Yeah. So I would probably call this guy the evens. Uh, just that's not that solution. Well, no, it is. The evens. So if it's equal to a zero, I'll add to the evens. So I'm removing odds. So I'll keep all the evens, and then in the end, I'll add the evens back over. Good. Yeah. But linked lists are memory inefficient to begin with. But uh, yeah, certainly this would be memory inefficient, but not incorrect. I mean, it'll get the job done. Because I mean, 
for instance, um, uh, especially until you maybe get uh, to be more um, um, experienced, to be a more experienced programmer where some of the solutions pop out at you, to initially have kind of an algorithm of solving these problems might mean that, hey, I'm being asked to do something, what am I gonna do? Well, I wanna remove the odds, so I'm gonna flip that around and say, I'm gonna collect the evens, done. Now I'm gonna go through, you could have even had a second, a, a loop in the middle there where you just go through and remove everything from the original, and then you put the evens back into it. So even though we'll say, look, I mean, you, you that was, there was a lot of redundancy there, you still broke the problem down to three steps. Collect the evens, empty the original list, fill it back up with the evens, right? That's a pretty straightforward approach to this problem, even though it's a little bit verbose. I would rather have that than maybe you trying to figure out how to play that game of, oh, my the size of my list is changing as I'm removing stuff from it. Or like you pointed out, maybe we mark the things that should be removed later on and, and kind of deal with that. Uh, um, I don't know, after the fact, I think that would still have its own complications associated with it. But um, a inefficient correct solution is still always going to be better than an efficient incorrect one. All right, other questions about this one? All right, so that was what, question four, five? That was question five. Question six. Assume you have access to the same stuff, write a method that takes a linked list as a parameter and duplicates the elements in the list. For example, 357 would become 335577. Um, okay, again, we're not returning a new linked list. We are taking in a pointer to a linked list and duplicating each of the elements inside of that list. So void um, duplicate list takes a link list pointer ll as a parameter, just like we did before. We'll say for int i is equal to zero. I is less than ll dot get count i plus plus. And what we want to do each time is we want to add another value to our list at this current index. So we'll say ll add at index ll our index is i the value we're adding is ll get at index i and then we'll push i forward an extra an extra step because again i changed the size of my list i need to take an extra little hop because i just added a second guy so I get to bucket zero, what did I do? I added at bucket zero, whatever I used to find at bucket zero. So now at bucket zero and bucket one, I have the same value. So now I need to jump to bucket two for my next uh, pass through, so on and so forth. So this guy will go through and duplicate every element uh, of our list. But similarly, you could have taken a different approach, right? You could have said, okay, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna create a brand new list I'm gonna fill up, so each time for every one element of this guy, I'm gonna add that thing twice to my other list. So if you wanna write it that way, you could do something like this. Um, linked list pointer answer is equal to a new linked list. And then as we're going through this guy, what are we going to do? We're gonna say, LL, and actually I probably would have written this uh, similar to this. I would have written it like while LL gets count is greater than zero, I would say answer dot add uh, at end LL dot get front. And I just do that same line a second time. I'll just add it twice. Then ll that remove front, which will make it one smaller than it used to be. Yada yada yada. 
So when this while loop is done, answer is filled up with every value that was in LL twice. Why? I put it in there twice. I put it in there once and I put it in there again. Then I removed it. All right. Now we need to go through and copy all those things back over. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than answer dot get count i plus plus ll dot add end answer dot get at index i. That'll put everything back into ll. Go ahead. Would you be able to just say LL? Um, no. And why is that? Because LL is a variable that holds. So the question was for those of you online, could I just say down here, instead of doing this, could I just say LL is equal to answer? You would think you could, that, that you, you would might be um, um, coaxed into trying to do that, right? But what are you actually doing? What you're doing is you're sending LL equal to a new memory address. You are not changing the value at the memory address that LL holds. When this function's over, LL, this variable disappears. We go back and that memory address that was originally passed in is what we're gonna be looking at. We didn't change what was at that memory address. We changed this local variable that lives and dies with this list to be a new memory address, which is just gonna disappear when it's gone. What we're doing here is we are actually writing to a place in memory that somewhere else in our program also points to. LL points there and then, you know, maybe it's like my list points to that same place in memory. If I change the value of LL, that's not gonna change my list here at all. Does that make sense? All right, so um, I understand why we might be um, persuaded to do something like that, but that's the difference between pointers and uh, pass by value versus pass by reference. Changing the address that this guy holds does not change the contents of the original address that was passed in. Go ahead. Uh, where did I do? Yeah, I should. It should all be arrow at end. Yeah. But yeah, just a, just as a, an example, um, and that's related to actually the last question on the uh, exam, right? So all these should be arrows, um, not dots. Um, if I had it taken a link list like that, then it would be a dot. All right. So that was number five, six. Now I'm on to number seven. Write a method name index of that uh, takes a linked list uh, and an int for which to search. The method should return the index where that int is first found or a negative one if it's not present. Okay, so the, the usual things we're effectively writing the strings in the string from Java's index of uh, method. And we're going to return an int called index of. This guy is going to take a linked list pointer ll and an int value to search for. And we're going to go through every element in that list for int i is equal to zero, i is less than ll. Get count. i plus plus. If ll get an index is equal to value to search for. If that's the guy I, that I've been looking for, I'm gonna go ahead and return I, the place I found it. If I search through that entire list that I never found it, I'll return a negative one. So index of, takes a linked list, takes the thing we're searching for, go through every element of that linked list, if the current element I'm looking at, and actually this is get in index i, if the current element that I'm looking at is equivalent to the element I was searching for, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna return the position where I found it. 
If I do that for the entire list and I never find the guy I was searching for, I'll return a negative one. It wasn't found. All right, questions on that one. All right. Uh, write a method, reverse lists. It takes a linked list as a parameter and returns a new linked list. Doesn't have to reverse it in place. It returns a brand new one. That is the original in reverse. Okay, so what is, what is this really testing? It's testing the difference between knowing that something's passed by address and you're changing it in the original place versus you're creating a new link list that you're then returning. All right, so we would have something like, uh, this guy's gonna return a link list pointer and it's gonna be called reverse list and it'll take a linked list pointer LL as a parameter. So we wanna go through, so we're gonna say link list pointer answer is equal to new linked list. So we'll give ourselves an empty link list. We wanna loop through LL in reverse Rent i is equal to zero. For rent i is equal to ll get count minus one. i is greater than or equal to zero. i minus minus answer dot add end. Keep in mind, I work with a lot of different languages on a given day. On a given day. Um, all right, so answer add end. Um, what am I doing? Oh, answer add end. Then I'm going to add ll get at index i. Now, um, one issue here is so this is kind of where it did matter how you um, decided this. Uh, uh, Actually, it probably wouldn't have mattered in this case because if you decided that get add index returned a node and you also decided that add end could return a node, you would have been safe here. But a lot of people, this kind of gets back to that problem I referenced uh, earlier where you were reinventing the wheel rather than using the built-in linked list methods that we had already worked hard writing in class and stuff. And now we have this awesome tool that we can use. You just said, you know what, I'm gonna, I choose to ignore the functionality of this tool. I'm just gonna do pointer crap some more <laughs> inside here and hook stuff up. What uh, a lot of folks ended up doing is they ended up um, breaking the original list by extracting a node from the, the first list and then setting its next node to something else. So now your original list is, is, is disconnected. Things are lost, the list is floating off into the nether or whatever. Um, so if you're using the built-in functions, presumably we're getting a payload from here. You assumed it was a node, you could say dot get payload, whatever. Um, but you're getting a payload from here and you're going to add that to the end of our new answer, which will create a copy of that payload. A brand new node will get instantiated and that's what will get linked to the end of answer. Not the old node being, you know, surgically removed from one and added to another, leaving this, you know, empty husk <laughs> floating out in the middle of nowhere. Um, all right, then in the end, we're gonna return answer. All right, so common mistake there, and this kind of gets back to the idea I said, you know, you start trying to do brain surgery with these guys instead of relying on the logic we already wrote. Now you start risking, you know, destroying uh, pointers in memory and stuff like that. Okay, common mistake. Um, also understand, so again, I'll remind everybody, remember I have the same policy, you do better in the final exam than you did in the midterm. Um, I'll, uh, um, you know, replace your midterm exam score with what you got in the final exam. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think it was pretty clear why people miss points. And I think most of the people, like for instance, the, I think was uh, two people got 90s. I mean, under most circumstances, those two people are gonna probably come back and get hundreds on the, on the final you know, the couple points they missed are gonna be instructive points that were missed. They're like, oh, I won't do that again. You know, keep in mind that the things that, uh, 
that you missed on these are things that are now going to be stuck with you that you know the theme of this was oh i remove stuff from a link list it changes its size that's a true statement as you go get into industry and you start working with any sort of dynamic collection you don't want to make changes to a dynamic collection at the same time as you're going through a dynamic collection. That's a truth in computer programming. All right. Um, if you're making changes to it, you are now adjusting the size of it, which is going to become a problem. Um, so you need to either avoid that or make a copy of that, make changes to the copy, whatever it is. Yeah. I would say that's a pretty fair thing. Um, you know, he, he asked, is, is this similar to just the concept of um, uh, maybe say it, we'll say it backwards. You maybe don't want to have uh, some things reading from a file while like two or three different things are writing to that same file. Because who, you know, now you have this whole who wrote last and when did you read <laughs> um, type situation to see which version of the data you actually got, right? Um, yeah, so we want to make sure that the source of our data um, isn't being destroyed or isn't being uh, um, isn't being modified while we're at the same time trying to use it for something else. Okay, if bucket I was, you know, if, if bucket two used to be one thing and now you added something to it, so bucket two is actually something else. Or in the situation where you walk backwards, um, you know, the backwards solution is an interesting solution to these because it requires you to not have to do the um, you know, the, the extra little add something thing, um, you know, but it also then becomes a little bit less uh, intuitive when you're actually looking at the code, like, oh, why are we going through this in reverse? Well, it doesn't really matter if you were removing odds in reverse or removing odds and, you know, going forwards, you're still removing odds. But, um, you know, I think that the, uh, the most straightforward algorithms probably make the most sense and don't try to get fancy with it. Um, you know, whatever. All right, other questions about that? All right, number nine. Uh, what does this code do? So we're creating a link list. We are going ahead and, and notice I have a comment here, returns a node without removing or disconnecting it. All right. So we have our cur node, which is a node at position pause in here. So, you know, uh, position pause is, you know, presumably something, you know, zero, one, two, five, let's say it was position five. So what is this guy gonna be right here? Cur node is the node that lived at position five, as well as all of the nodes that are hooked to that dude after position five. Then we're adding to answer, which is a fresh link list, cur node. So, and then we're returning answer. So what is answer? Answer is a linked list whose first node is cur node. And that might have more nodes depending on what the length or the count of LL was. So really the, the length of uh, answer is gonna be LL get count minus pause. That's the number of elements that are actually being returned by answer. Even though we only added one thing to answer here, cur node has some passengers. There's things hanging off that guy like parasites. And uh, we added that uh, node to the front of answer, no problem. But just because we added one thing doesn't mean that the freeloaders didn't come along. All right, make some sense. So this has to do with that idea of uh, um, pointers uh, when you don't disconnect the pointer, we have things that are still hanging on left over. And we kind of talked in class that when you remove something from a list, when you write that implementation, you know, one good rule of thumb that I like to follow is the idea of always fully disconnect it. If you want something to leave, make it leave. <laughs> Go ahead. So if it's paused with zero, and this is something that would just be copy the list. Copy the list. But, but it would... I don't know if I like the use of the word copy there. He said, if, if pause was zero, is this copying the list? It, it's, it's not copying it because still all the nodes only exist once. You're just creating two separate pointers to the front of that list. 
Yeah, so you have a string of nodes that exist in memory and you get, can get to that string of nodes through this variable LL or presumably whoever, whatever variable is passed in as LL, as well as this new thing called answer. They both point to the same place in memory, which is the first element of this linked list. You're not actually copying the nodes. Correct. Yeah. No new nodes are being created here. Yeah. And the reason we know that is because of this comment. It says this guy specifically returns a node as opposed to like when we wrote those other uh, example codes, I said, you can make the assumption if it returns a node or returns the payload itself. In this case, if I didn't have this comment here, you could have certainly made the assumption that, although I also have it written where this guy's catching a node. Um, but if I didn't have that comment there, you could have said something like, oh, well, you know, when I get a, uh, this position, I'm going to just get a number. And when I add, when I, when I add a number to the front, presumably that's creating a brand new node around that integer, which would then be a copy in that particular case. All right. More questions about that one? Go ahead. Um, like, is, it a, is there a practical reason to do something like this? I, I think maybe, um, because I think sometimes you uh, uh, maybe think something along the lines of like, when you might want to use like a substring of something, you might want to have a portion of a list, maybe even something like with merge sort of a linked list um where you want to pass parts of it around I, I mean that still might be a little overkill because i think if i was writing merge sort for linked list i think i'd still just keep track of begin and end with indexes um uh, because i think but but based on your question stuff like that you you could you could say i'm interested in a portion of this uh list starting from some place and all right anything else on that one all right, so this last one, easily the most missed. Um, uh, and it's something we actually talked about right when we first started looking at uh, um, our creating objects with this arrow syntax uh, in class. So what is the arrow syntax here as it relates to pointers in C++? All right, a lot of people said, oh, this is basically the same thing as the dot syntax in Java. While it technically um, performs the same ultimate task. This arrow set in C++, both the dot syntax and the arrow syntax exist. Both of those are legal syntaxes and they're not equivalent to each other. All right, so in C++, you can say something like, in C++, both this, and this exists. The dot syntax allows you to get at a value from a dereferenced source. Dereferenced source. We, we probably most commonly see this with structs in C++. Where a struct, I mentioned structs are passed by value. And since structs are passed by value, if we had a struct being passed to a function or something like that, we would have a physical struct, not the address of a struct, but a physical struct. So it's already dereferenced to its value, its actual value. So if I have the value of something, so for instance, the code I wrote earlier, I was passing in linked list, not linked list pointers. So in that case, I didn't do it on purpose. It just so happened that one error also fixed the other error. Right? So I was taking in linked lists. And since it was a linked list and not a linked list pointer, I could say LL dot because it was already dereferenced. It was the value that was equal to that linked list. So that would be the example of uh, way back when, when we talked about pass by reference versus pass by value. And I said C++ empowers the programmer to make dumb mistakes. 
example I usually use is they, hey, you're having your party at 8 p.m. Do you give me the address or do you hand me your house? Hey, I, I was passing in the house. It's not smart, but you can do it in C++. Java says you always have to pass by address if it's an object. C++, I said, look, yeah, I'm asking for a linked list here. Since I'm asking for a linked list, you give me the linked list, not the address in the linked list. You give me the actual linked list. Um, but uh, so then you could use the dot uh, stuff for that. So the dot notation here works on it operates on already dereferenced values where we've we've looked it up and gotten the actual thing that lives there. The arrow syntax dereferences and gets at a value all in one step. So if you wanted to give an example, let's see in here, I said, for example, this name is equal to name or some pointer, it's trying to show the two different examples of the arrow syntax that it's not only used with the, this keyword. So this guy right here is the same thing as star this dot name equals name. And this guy here is the same thing as star some pointer dot do something. We would say that writing something like this feels a little inconvenient, right? By having to put the parentheses around it and put the star there and says, go ahead and get me the value, dereference it. I'm saying, give me the value that lives at that address. Then call the do something function on that value. I can do this all in one fell swoop by using the arrow syntax, which says, get the value here, then call this function on the value. And this is legal syntax in C++. It's just inconvenient syntax when you start having to throw extra parentheses and stuff like that on there. Does that make sense? All right. And this ultimately goes back to that idea that in Java, objects are always, 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 always passed by reference. And Java doesn't give us any option to do it other to do it otherwise. Java then also removes any special syntax for working with pointers, which then says that Java can just treat the dot can use dots for both values and addresses. Even though I, since I got rid of structs as well, I don't know that you would ever actually have to use a dot for that. But a dot will dereference a the calling value in the event that it needs to be dereferenced. And if it did exist, that it didn't need to be dereferenced, which I can't come up with an example where that would be true in Java because of the handcuffs they put on you, um, it would presumably um, do that automatically for you as well. That's Java's MO is we'll just automatically do what makes sense. Yeah. So will that mean like you know? Well, it wouldn't be harder. They're the same thing. Just you wouldn't say this guy returns a linked list pointer. You'd say it returns a linked list, which is the address of the linked list. Correct. A node object. It wouldn't be a node pointer. It would be a node, which would still be a node pointer. You just don't have a special syntax for it. Because in Java, if you wrote a node class and you had a variable of type node, it's a variable that holds a memory address, yeah. right? So it is a pointer. It's just always a pointer. You don't get the option to say, I'm actually not going to deal with node pointers here. I just want to pass around houses all day long. You know, like, look, I can, I got plenty of RAM, no big deal. Just, this is just how I do it. <laughs> you know, you, you have that option in C++ to be memory inefficient just because. Or Java doesn't let you do that. In fact, they've taken away the syntax to even let you do it, which then also has this caveat of saying, look, you don't need any special. I mean, Java could have certainly just said, oh, we'll just keep the arrow syntax and no longer do we have the dot syntax. 
They certainly could have done that, right? In fact, there isn't a great reason why they didn't do it. Um, somebody, they were probably sitting there and saying, well, which makes more sense to us? People coming from C++ or coming from C, C++ is probably the better example because now you're familiar with objects. You know, they're already used to working with both the arrow and the dot syntax. Dot syntax is one key, arrow syntax is two keys, one key is less than two keys, so let's go with the dot. It might have been as simple as that, right? There might have been a coin flip, there could have been a bet, maybe there was a fight, we, we don't know. But ultimately, they didn't need to have two different choices because Java is making decisions for them. Man, oh, do you guys hear about the, the fight I was in uh, two weeks ago? Oh man, it was awesome. Noah, one of our uh, seniors and introduced me to uh, this, uh, this guy who's like, I don't know, like a US champion in Sambo. Is it Sambo or Sam? I think Sambo, some martial art thing. Sam, is it Samba? Yeah, I think Samba is a dance. I think Sambo, it's something similar like a grappling martial art. So I asked Noah, I said, am I gonna have to fight this guy? You know, and Noah said, well, maybe. So I came in go, ready to go for bear. Soviet martial art. Yeah, see, Soviet martial art. It, was, it wasn't that I drank him out of the table. <laughs> I didn't actually fight him. <laughs> for those of you online, I, I'm not much of a fighter. I want to blow a knee out again. <laughs> I, I, my martial art, I, I, was, I, I employ the techniques of a two-year-old. I grab them and I just go dead weight and hope I fall on something. <laughs> because I mean, I got a pretty good amount of gravity assist. So I mean, if I fall on something, bad things are gonna happen. Yeah, then I get to wear those diaper things. That's a good call. I like Japanese food too. <laughs> I wouldn't look that dissimilar to this guy. <laughs> I mean, I think I actually probably do outweigh a good number. I don't know what the average weight of a sumo wrestler is, but I think we've done the math. I outweigh most um, um, North American species of bear. <laughs> <laughs> you put under, you put under. Well, I mean, we just make the assumption that I mean, somebody's like not a whole lot of people weigh 400 pounds. Bears are only about 375. <laughs> I mean, you start getting into the Kodiaks, you know, the grizzly bears, the polar bears. I mean, they're heavier, especially the males. I outweigh some female polar bears, you know, but you're not going to get in a fist fight with a female polar bear. Well, unless you start messing with the cubs. Yeah. No, no, no. Bears are like all sheet muscle. See, I am not. <laughs> I'm just heavy. <laughs> What's up? That's right. That's right. But I do float. Like, I don't even know on these cruise ships why they make me put on my flotation device because all my weight's in my stomach. So not only do I float, I float face up like a bobber. <laughs> Messed up thing is everything we just said is true. We <laughs> can fact check you all day long. <laughs> all right. So questions on the, uh, the exam. Hopefully we learned some stuff in uh, taking it. Um, if you think I treated you unfairly on a question, I mean, I'm not above, uh, you know, making a grading mistake. I do grade with names off, but I also grade all the questions, like all of question one at once, all of question two at once. So I try to evenly apply when, especially when you have examples where people make the same mistake, unless you've made that mistake plus another mistake, you're going to lose the same number of points as somebody else who made the, uh, the same mistake. Um, if you got a lot of feedback that said something along the lines of this is incompetent or um, something like that, you want to really ask yourself why you're uh, struggling with this stuff. I think it's probably because you're um, not doing your homework and 
that kind of stuff. All right, so let's uh, spend our last couple of minutes here uh, starting to introduce stacks. For a link list? Okay. We got to the point where we were about to do the actual. Oh, 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 we, oh, yeah. So didn't I say it was, okay, I, I get it. I get it. Which I think that was the point that was complicated. Okay. I got it. Um, why don't we here, just for the sake of time, um, that way I don't go and rush to do it again and not be able to finish it. I'll put a note here to, uh, um, <laughs> Time to go for bear. <laughs> Is it going to let me do anything? I still. Keto update. That is ridiculous. They won't let you use the software that worked five minutes ago. It's like, oh, there's an update. You're not allowed to use. Huh? Look, there's not even an update. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good that's a good way to spend our last couple of minutes. Yeah, no, you're good. Oh, let's let's talk about that. Uh, so, uh, as Jonathan just pointed out, on Saturday, April seventeenth. From 8:30 a.m. to 8:30 p.m., 12 hours, we're going to have another hackathon uh, hosted by the Hackathon Club. Um, uh, so it's here on campus. There's going to be options for online too for people who aren't local. Jonathan, is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you're not comfortable coming to campus or you're not in proximity to campus, um, you can still um, uh, participate. You are cordially uh, required. Uh, to attend this event, there will be an alternate, um, not so nice assignment uh, to do over that weekend. If you uh, choose not to go to the hackathon, um, this is mostly targeted at folks who legitimately can't go to the ha hackathon for whatever reason. Um, so there, I would hope that there wouldn't be uh, many people who would quote choose not to go to the hackathon. There's quite a bit of learning that takes place in that 12 hours, and I think that would be a very, very, very good use of time, so much so that I'm uh, requiring it and then giving a homework assignment that would uh, be that would discourage you from choosing to uh, skip it. So um, to sign up, do they have to just message you or is there a link or what's the deal? Show more. All right. Where's, where's, where's this, this guy? So go to this Google form thing to sign up to make sure that they have a, um, a list of who's going to be there and um, do you have on that uh, Google form whether or not they're going to be in person or online. Yeah, I have like a preference. Okay, got it. Yeah, because that might be helpful for like making sure we have snacks or drinks or whatever. Um, and I don't know what you guys have left in your your budget, but we can the department can help with the food and stuff. Huh? Yeah, well, whatever it is, we I want to make sure that it should be a fun event, not a starvation situation. So we can certainly kick in coffee and um, bacon. Turkey bacon. <laughs> Turkey bacon. That's the, the, the penalty assignment is over the weekend, you have to live stream yourself eating no less than four pounds of turkey bacon. Well, across the whole weekend, that's not that bad. Okay, you're right. That's horrible. <laughs> Hence the penalty assignment. <laughs> I think turkey sausage is better than turkey bacon. It's still better than turkey bacon. The calf's turkey sausage is still better than the calf's turkey bacon. Four pounds? 
Yeah, oh, but but four pounds of it? Sure. Yeah, we, I I'm feeling I'm feeling live streaming four pounds. I could a live stream four pounds. I'd probably have to do it over twenty four hours. Well yeah, so it's just a long live stream. <laughs> just, <laughs> just sit in front of the plate. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That, well, the, the question, I don't have a problem providing the money to provide the turkey bacon, but ethically, I don't know if I can bring myself to purchase turkey bacon. You just have to put the money under the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah. Providing the, 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 the financial ability to get turkey bacon is easy. But I don't know that I could go into a store and actually pick it up off the shelf and like feel like I've haven't disappointed society. Like, I feel like if we had a bear in the room and you put a pile of turkey bacon down, they wouldn't eat it. No, no, not bears are, they, well, they'll eat whatever they can find, but they, they enjoy meat. There's a, there's an old video of um, a competitive eater, Kobayashi, um, one of the hot dog eating guys. Uh, there was a, a TV show called Man vs. Beast, and um, uh, you can find it on YouTube where it's Kobayashi versus the bear, and because they the bear wouldn't eat the buns, so they decided it would just be hot dogs, and they had this giant pile of hot dogs, and so Kobayashi's in a cage, and the bear's in another cage, you know, so the bear wouldn't kill Kobayashi, right? And there's this pile of like 200 hot dogs in front of them. And, you know, so the question is, who's going to eat more hot dogs? Kobayashi, the guy who had done like, you know, 78 hot dogs in, you know, 10 minutes, hot dogs and buns, or this bear. Um, and the, the rule was they, the, the thing starts when the bear starts eating. And this bear was huge. It was like an eight, 900 pound bear. I mean, it was some grizzly. That bear ate those hot dogs so fast. <laughs> he was like licking them up. <laughs> and then he started going after Kobayashi's. He was striking at the cage and stuff. That was a great episode. He also had like an NFL guy going up against like, I think a cheetah and like an agility test, like going down an obstacle course. And you had uh, some Olympic sprinter racing a zebra. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it was really great entertainment. We've, we really, TV shows have gone downhill since that period of time yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. that's actually a good one thank you that's in general right <laughs> we're talking about bears eating hot dogs <laughs> stop interrupting <laughs> all right hold on um so if you go back to general here notice that v uh put up we're gonna have a tech talk this is next uh wednesday uh 31st uh at 6 p.m there's a zoom link uh, looks like it's uh, uh, Professor Locklayer's classroom Zoom. I'm guessing it's that same link. All right, so here's the Zoom link. And the company um, that's doing it, it's actually a very interesting. I met this guy. Um, I actually had introduced V to this uh, person, and she was applying for a job there, too. Um, Komatsu is a Japanese company, uh, but they have um, offices over here now, and they do a lot with artificial intelligence stuff with large mining equipment so they have these fully robotic things that are you know digging out mines and, and stuff so they're going to be presenting on that so it's a really cool i mean this is i think something that's very interesting at these tech talks is you know as computer science students we have this mentality of oh well here's like the three places i can go and work at as a computer programmer we never would have thought about digging in the dirt as being related to that so there's so many industries that rely on artificial intelligence and robotics and software engineering. Um, so I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to go to that. I kind of want to make that required too. Let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me think about that. Cause that, I feel like a Saturday, a month in the future is easier than an evening um and i would i would say that the, i'm not going to require it but i'll tell you what a lot of those tech talks turn into internships for our students so it would be a um wise for you to go and learn about these companies and maybe give your resume to the to the guy i mean for all you know he'll throw it out but yeah if you 
You'll never have a chance of having it unless you, you give it to them. Yep. Yeah, they definitely have an internship program. Uh, I think they're, uh, they're probably about three months away from full-time employment uh, opportunities because uh, V ended up taking a job at FIS. Um, they were trying to create a position for her at Komatsu, but their time, timing wasn't great. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. I was getting ready to, oh, was I able to add that slide or not? I know, yeah, yeah. So I want to do <laughs> better safe than sorry, right? Finish insertion sort. Start here. Finish insertion sort. All right. So we'll finish that up uh, next time. Shouldn't take very long. And then we will uh, start talking about stacks and we're going to write uh, our next project is going to be Towers of Hanoi using stacks. Oh man, that's going to, it's going to haunt your dreams. <laughs> and then we're going to merge sort the towers. No, since I'm gone. <laughs> veggie bacon? Veggie bacon? I'm going to say that veggie bacon still a, a, better than turkey bacon. The, not, I'm not even arguing taste. I'm just saying that they already have this idea that, look, if you're a vegetarian, we're going to have like fake equivalents of other things. So veggie bacon is starting off with the baseline saying this isn't real bacon. Okay. The turkey bacon just is stupid. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree with that. <laughs> um, Let me get this proper.